Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. I am really excited about this video that I'm about to share with you. I have decided I've been studying chess miniatures this entire last week. That is games that are finished within 20 to 25 moves, just short, quick games. <clears throat> I've been studying out of one of my very favorite books, this great big thick black one by Laszlo Polgar. He is the teacher of his three daughters, the Polgar sisters, who have all become world champions. And at one time, they were uh, one or the other was the strongest woman chess player in the world. <clears throat> this thing has 5,334 chess problems, games, and combinations fantastic resource. So if you've gone through this, uh, some of this may be recognizable. It depends on how long ago you went through this. But I'm going to take a few of the chess miniatures from here. Sometimes you just have to sit back, grab a bowl of popcorn or your favorite pizza or something, and just watch chess games to enjoy. Yes, we all love to learn, we want to learn, and we are learning, but sometimes you gotta let your hair down a little, you know what I mean, and just enjoy the lightning bolt out of the blue, or the stunning rook, or queen, or knight sacrifice, or the absolutely mind-boggling sacrifice of one piece after another after another to get to the opponent's king. This is fun stuff. This is gonna just blow your mind. You've never seen games like this before. And it is precisely for that reason that this is what keeps us coming back for more chess. Because we all, every one of us, have had stuff like this done to us. And it makes us pull our hair and weep and wail and lament, lament. Some of us have also, if not all of us, delivered this kind of a zap, zow, zing, bang, bam, kabloom, powerhouse sacrifices to checkmate the opponent. And when we do that, we feel literally invincible. Yeah. So I'm going to show you some razzle-dazzle chess. You just sit back and enjoy. And I'm going to do this for several videos simply because you ain't seen nothing like this. This is the funnest kind of chess to explore. Let's get on with it. Angel versus Bushki, 1940. These games range anywhere from the 1840s all the way up to the 1990s. He's got like four to six hundred of them in his book. It's incredible how awesome these games are. <clears throat> and we'll see several openings that we are familiar with. We will, of course, see them arguing for the center etc. We will see the importance of speedy development and excellent piece placement, etc. But what we're going to see most of all is just the lightning bolt out of the blue. We are going to see moves that just drop your jaw. So this is a very good fight for the center, of course. And white is going to castle early, and then the queen will come out. So you can see each side is, is developing very, very well. There are some releasings of tension in the center while still arguing for the center. And now this is one theme we will see again and again. is the importance of the rooks. Without question, this is one of the main themes, one of the 
overall themes that the majority of these games will show us in one way or another the power of the rooks on the open files. Notice how black takes the knight in order to disrupt white's kingside if he can at all get away with it. He doesn't, but this changes the nature of the center and the argument for the center now, doesn't it? Now, black is going to bump back. Notice how he retreats. There must be a good guardian for the king side. Yeah, the knight is an excellent one. So he makes sure. And now, finally, white is developing the queen side, and so is black. He's completing his development. Notice how black has almost completed his development faster than white did, but here comes white coming to the rescue. Notice again, one of the themes of these games is usually, on one side or another, the attack of the guardian of the king, and the king's not even castled yet. That's another theme, is the lack of the king castling, which is really, truly very important. Here we see the black has not taken the time to do so. Here comes the lightning bolt. Just astonishing what white does here. And yet it is... It is incoherent, I mean incoherent, it is inherent logic of how the pieces work together. But here's the lightning bolt. Queen takes F6. And you go, what? Yeah, here we go. Queen sacrifice to crack open the king side, and it doesn't look like he's got enough into this, does it? You're going, dude, you really blew it. Hold on. Now we've got, the queen got rid of this, the uh, guardian, right? So now the knight follows up with check, and observe the roll of the rook on the open file, pinning the bishop. Very cool coordination of pieces, yeah? So king must go to f8, and now another really outstanding move in this position where it doesn't look like white has very much of anything. He's got the checkmate. <laughs> you look at that and you go, wow, that's amazing. So that's just the first one. I've got a lot more of these for you. Hang on, and I'll show you the next one. All right, can we get another cool game like that last from Heavens? Yes. Let's look at this game with Buckley versus an Anonymous. This is in 1840, but let's observe how modern some of these openings are, even though they were played 150, 160 years ago, it's fun to see how sometimes these games were really much more exciting than so many of our games today that end up being dryish. Let's see how they played chess 150 years ago. You'll notice not only are they arguing for the center, locking it basically, but they are developing swiftly, they are putting pressure on each other's center, they are getting their pieces, their minor pieces out first, they are really playing an interesting game. Bishop to g5, that's a theme we'll see is these bishops coming out, uh, pinning the knights in their place. Yeah, here we go, bishop g4. This is another theme that we see that's really prevalent. Another pattern we'll see is as they've developed, and this is, this is rather a symmetrical development. White will break the symmetrical development with a move like knight d5. 
And that's an important theme. Notice how Black attempts to copy him on this. And now here comes the problem with the symmetricals. The problem is the symmetricals give white a better opportunity. I'm not sure if you were aware of that or not, but now you are. What is this? Did white go to sleep? Did white forget about his queen? Apparently so. So now black is trouncing white, and he's in the position to put white to sleep permanently. Here we go. How about it? Again. The important square is the F6 square. Usually a black knight occupies that square. But in this instance, a white knight will check. Lightning bolt out of the blue. Check. And you go, holy cow, dude, yes, because not only does it break up the kingside castle defense of black, but it also provides an amazing, speedy checkmate. What this shows us without question is do not underestimate the power of the bishops combined with the knight. The minor pieces really sing a song of redemption when you use them right. I've got more for you, though. Grab your pizza. We're nowhere near done, baby. We are putting the pedal to the metal, mama. We're going to be mo Tatin. Yeah. And this next one, lest you think only those really, really, really old games back in the 1800s produce sensational attacks and blitzkrieg-type moments, hold your britches, man. Grab your pizza. This one is Turnplemeyer versus Müller in 1950. I believe it was held in Germany. Again, we have a Sicilian. They're playing hard, fast, and true to the spirit of chess, which says you must either possess or you must control the center and do so with as many pieces as you can and try to set up yourself so that your position is stronger than your opponent's. And this is what we see them all attempting to do, either preventing your opponent from doing something they want, or putting yourself in the position to where you can do what you want. This is how these guys play chess. And it's really interesting that this time there's not a lot of direct tension in the center as of yet. And yet they are hurrying and getting it all out there. And now black is the first to put the tension in. And white will respond by saying, thank you for the free pawn. And black says, that pawn wasn't free. I'm going to take you back. That's the way it works. And white says, well, if you're going to do that, then I'm going to do this. <clears throat> Blam. Bishop h6 already. Black hasn't even castled yet. And he's already attacking the castled king's defensive player, the black bishop on g7. Isn't that interesting? I'm not quite sure I've ever seen this. So black says, well, all right, I'll, I'll go ahead and castle anyway. And white says, that's fine by me. I'm still going to take the defender of the king here, one of the defenders of the king, in a fianchetto position, the bishop being a very, very good piece indeed. And now, white puts the knight at f4. And black gains more important central space and puts the question to the other knight, attempting to kind of cramp white here. Yes? 
White says, not a problem. I'm going to come up to d5. A rook left to get the rooks involved in this really quick. And White agrees, let's put the rooks in here. Look at that magnificent open file. Again, that theme plays its part in so many of these miniature games because it's so overwhelmingly powerful. Not only central control, hasty and fast development so that you can coordinate your pieces better, but the rooks on open files, and then, of course, the piece sacrifices. Let's keep watching. We've got a long way to go, and look at this. Contesting the open file. Yeah, how many times have you heard that, right? Yeah, now, and you're going, wait a minute, wait a minute, man. Why are you pushing the kingside pawns? Because doesn't this create weakness on your castle kingside? Indeed it does. Yes, it does. He is willing to do so, however, because, one, his center is fairly strong, and the second thing is, look at the position of his knights. His knights are up there, which means, again, with a pawn storm, you have pieces backing the pawns, right? You can see that. Yeah, the pieces will back up that h-pawn, and you've got the queen lurking in the background. So this may not appear to be too hastily after all, Rook will come to d7, again hitting the center. And now, again, that important f6 square. Yeah, look at this position unfold as white probes for the weaknesses in the position. This is really interesting to see. And you say... Your commentary is complete blather, because all he did is he gave away his knight. I mean, duh. That wasn't a spectacular move. Whoa! We're not done yet. Don't be hasty to judge, boys and girls. Let's see what happens. Now for a lightning bolt. Do you see it? Here comes one of those moves that 90% of us will say, uh-uh, I wouldn't have even looked at that. <laughs> and that's a lesson for us. We need to look at all options. Yeah. Checks, captures, and threats. Look at them all. As my good friend Chess Diagnostic says on his excellent chess channel, Shout out to Chess Diagnostic. Dude, you're awesome. Go check out his channel. What is the threat here? Well, you have a check, not a capture, but you do have a threat. Knight H5. Yeah! And that got an exclamation point. And you go, why? Why would that get an exclamation point? Because it just stupidly, again, look, now you're two knights down. But notice the effect on the position. And now when we use chess diagnostics theme here of checks, captures, or threats, we begin with the strongest chess piece to look, look, first you start with the queen, then you go to the rooks, then the bishops, then the knights, etc. We see something absolutely magnificent here. Remember the importance. I've already emphasized that in the previous video, and I have this one too, but now look at this. Checkmate. The sacrifice of two knights changed the structure of the black king side, didn't it? Enough that you can literally seal off the king and go and get him. That's a beautiful illustration, man. So, but I'm nowhere near done, and I'm serious. I've got more eye-popping, cool chess stuff to show you, for real. Hang on, I'll be right back with another one. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 
Dragon! Yeah, yeah, I cut the dramatic. It's not that spectacular. Wrong answer, cowboy! But thanks for playing, I don't got a clue. This next game is just sweet. There is no other way to describe this thing, man. This is Blom versus Nielsen, 1934. Now, let's see what these guys do for us that is so entertaining. For one thing, you always get interesting games with the French defense, right? Okay, let's see what the heck. He's going to go for the standard, and of course, this is the accelerated, the quick exchange in the French. Knight will take the pawn, etc. So at this point, White has the lead in development, but not for long. Black's not worried about it. He bops his bishop out. White will also bring his bishop out. Now the knight, and now the other bishop again. That theme, bishop g5, that's such a prominent theme in so many of these miniatures, man. That's something we want to pay attention to. And we've also seen in one of the previous games the importance that you got a castle, man. You just got a castle. You gotta! You gotta! I'm telling you. And once... Again, really, no joke. Okay, I, I know I've said time and again, you really don't want to start attacking until you're fully developed. But watch this. We're talking Shazam! Blap. Knight F6 check. And you go, come on, wouldn't your chest teacher give you a quick backhand across the head? Not this time. Your chess teacher would sit, sit there in awe at your absolute fabulous insight. Destroying the king cover. Sacrificing the knight. The bishop will take the pawn, pinning the knight to the queen, and pinning the king to where he is. The queen has to try to get into here somehow. However, the situation looks cramped, doesn't it? On the white's side, you have wide open, glorious territory and space. Observe how white takes advantage of this very interesting situation to coordinate his pieces, whereas black just appears to be congested. His pieces just can't get there. Blam! Check! <laughs> you go, wow! Yeah! Isn't that something? Bishop takes h7, check. King takes the bishop. Okay, now look at the position of the king. Yeah, that's the issue, isn't it? A sacrifice of a couple of minor pieces, you guys, to put the opponent's king out in the open field almost always works. And that is one of the cool things to learn in these chess miniatures. I am so serious. The sacrifice of one, sometimes two, we will see games where they sacrifice three pieces in order to open up the king is usually worth it. If you have open space, because now you've got this. Check, honey. Is that not remarkable to see the connection there? Yeah, take notice of that. I'm serious. We will see this type of theme throughout this series of videos. It's what makes the chess miniatures so fun to watch because it's not something you normally think of. 
but it does expand our understanding and our ability to be able to play this game better. And now, of course, ta-da! Simple schmimple. Checkmate. Fantastic. But I'm not done with you. Not even. Don't you even imagine you want to turn this off yet. I have another razzle-dazzle dozens of games to show you. Hang on to your britches. All right, this next gem of a game that you just don't want to miss is by Rasovsky and Mikiski, Correspondence 1908. This is fun stuff. King Pawn opening. Okay, here we go. And we're just going to possess the center with the pawns. And black agrees, let's do this, let's do this correctly. He bumps the c3. Black says, thank you for the free pawn, I like that idea. You just keep giving me stuff, and I'm going to keep on taking it. Yeah. So he goes, well, that's enough of that noise. Whoops. I'm going to come up to bishop c4. And he takes another pawn. Some moron set this board up incorrectly. Ha! That'd be me. The bishop should go there and the knight there, because here the bishop takes the pawn. Duh. Boy, what a dork. Okay. Now, at this point, really, the game plan is really easy. It is a wide open board for white, and he has the superior development. Black has got nothing position-wise, but he is up two pawns. But this opens up so that the pieces, so the theme now is get developed pronto, fast, speedy, hustle, baby, let's get Go put the pedal to the metal, burn the rubber, go! Right? And I can't overemphasize that. If you ever play it this way, now you really hustle with development. Both sides have to hurry. No dawdling allowed here, because it can be dangerous very, very fast as we are about to see. Boink, challenge him. Notice he ignores the threat at the moment and brings a piece out. Notice black is not responding to white's threat. He is yet developing another piece with tempo. That's how important it is to develop in this kind of a situation. Yeah. One, uh, the white king is a little open. But this also gives white the benefit of no pawns in his way. He can get out everything just as fast as he can. So there's upsides and downsides to this. Let's see how each player plays this. Notice he developed to block and he still ignores the threat because by, instead of moving a piece again, by bringing out yet another piece in development, he puts a pin on. And now Black's development is picking up steam. That's important. In these chess miniatures, probably the most single defining reason for the lightning bolt, for the astonishing sacrifices, is because you have more power in the field. You have developed more pieces. For the general most part, that is what we will see. So, by developing a piece, he also stops the pin. 
Okay? But notice they are using the pieces to play with. <clears throat> and now that the pin is stopped, he can move his knight. Notice where he places his knight, black has something up his sleeve. He's going to bring the knight forward into the middle, not out here but here. Not here, but here. Yeah, and I know, I know you say it's obvious why not there. No, it's not. Remember, these chess miniatures do not play the obvious. Sometimes they'll put a piece in danger and you go, what a moron. And then three moves later, it's checkmate because they did that. So let's keep watching here. This is really, really fun about these miniatures and now he will take the knight at c3. So, yes, he's really moved a lot of knight moves, but notice how it changes again the character of the chessboard because he did this. So the bishop will take the knight, and the bishop will take the bishop, and the knight will take the bishop, and again... We are at a liquidation type experience here in the game where white has the superior development and black has next to nothing. So again, the overall theme has not changed. You must get your pieces into this pronto. Black had better hope to heck he's got enough on the ball to castle and castle really stinking quick because that's dangerous. And sure enough, it's like he heard me back in 1908. <laughs> castle, dude? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, white comes right at him. A much stronger position for the knight. A very, very interesting fork of the queen and the pawn. Yeah, so now black is going to be forced to respond to white. And he goes back to d8. And I'm not sure about that. that. That, I, you know, I don't know, because now here comes white. And I mean, this is the other theme. Uh, and, and I know as a general rule, we don't develop our queen so boldly so early. But technically, you're in the middle phase of the game. And... Black is really having trouble developing. So, I think that queen move is entirely justified. Yeah, nothing's going to chase that queen off very much without serious consequences. I think Black realizes that because he goes, he does c6. And now, once more, no kidding. Knight to f6. How many times have we seen this, man? Holy cow, holy cow, check. And you're going to beat up the king side. This time, he's got support of the pawn, so the queen can't just take that knight. So this is a very powerful move that, once again, sacrifices a knight and cracks open the king side, exposing the king and Bishop's going to put himself in a position to where he can do some major damage. You're going to have to give the king room to move because you can see the attack coming. Absolutely. And now queen takes h7 check. Yeah. Okay. Kablam. Watch out. King f8. Watch out. Queen h8. Watch out, king's gonna get away, king's gonna get away, wrong, queen simply takes f6, check again, uh -oh. black goes to king f8, and now over to h6, not back to h8, h6, get the king to here, and now, Bring in your bishop. Because that will force the king to the corner, 
which is a simply marvelous that is where you want. Bishop g6 discovered check so that the king goes to g7. Now queen h7 check and the king goes to h8 and now you can see the checkmate. Queen takes f7 checkmate. That is a very interesting, instructive maneuver of the queen coordinating with the bishop in order to get a king checkmated. But it began with that electrifying knight sacrifice again from the d5 onto the f6. Cracking open the king side, and this can be the result. So I have another one for you. No, I'm not even bluffing. You know that famous song by the uh, rock band Drive Shaft? You all, everybody. You all, everybody. Yeah, that was uh, in the movie Lost. Yeah, of course, it's fictional, but that's what I'm saying. You all, everybody, pay attention to this next game. Yeah, the, the guy that played the part of Charlie, he was helping Claire take care of his baby in that series Lost. Did you know that was 2010? Ten years ago, man. We talked about that series forever. Anyway, you all, everybody going to make drive shaft famous even though they don't exist. This next game, Sprecher versus Lutzt in 1937, is just a simply marvelous darling. E4 and C6. And we have D4 and D5. So, we are going to immediately see an exchange. E takes the pawn, and C takes the D pawn, and now we're somewhat in a symmetrical, and now he breaks the symmetry, and he's going to start bringing out his minor pieces, which is entirely correct, and White says, yeah, that's a good argument, I'm going to start developing my minor pieces, and in fact, because you bumped the pawn, I'm going to get my other knight into this, and Black says, it's all good to me. I'm going to keep developing my bishops so that I can castle. And kind of a Londonish set up by White, isn't it? But Black doesn't care. He says, I'm going to castle here. And he says, that's appropriate. Notice how White releases the tension in this particular game and gains queenside space. Could be significant. That's always an option. When he does that, notice Black's reaction, knight to e4 right now. Contest the center. How does White respond? Not by exchanging the knight with the knight, but by putting more pressure on the Black Knight by developing his minor bishop. Cool little lessons in these chess miniatures, man. And now the knight will take the knight. So he's going to disrupt the queen side of white, attempting to weaken it because he does have more space, which makes perfect sense, and he's going to exchange here. And black exchanges with him there. So black does not have an option of utilizing the pawns on the queen side as a storm or as a defense, but it is open so that he can use his pieces easy enough. So it's technically not a crisis yet. The center is still firm. So let's see what happens. White shifts, which is one of the interesting strategies. Now he comes over to here. Over here, then he jumps over there. Then he plays the whole board. Black will respond likewise. He says, I understand, but I've got to get developed. So let's do this. Queen to c2, ensuring this pressure here. 
We want to point that out to you. There's always an option to crack open the king side. And therefore, the next knight move, even though black is not fully developed, the next knight move makes sense in light of the position. Yeah? He was here one move, now a second move guarding. That's okay. That's good heads up chess by Black. I, I'm just pointing that out to you. And another major theme, this position does in point of fact for White scream kingside attack. Yes, it does. And luck, yes, that is exactly what we're about to see. The question is, can he do it, is the question. Here it comes. So, defense, h6, ask the knight what he's going to do. Rather than responding, ooh, an interesting move. He brings the bishop to e5. And rather than responding to that, he brings his rook to e8, which supports his center. And because it's obvious white's going to attack the king side, he wants to make sure his king has maneuverability. Okay? So far, so good. You with me? Here we go. Bishop h7. Yeah, I, come on, it's a kingside attack. You had to see that coming. But that still just is so fabulous how the cooperation. Man, when you get two bishops into it with a knight and with a queen, I mean, come on, it's a thing of beauty to watch, right? Yeah, really. King f8. And here's why this makes this so much fun. Here's why we love the miniatures and the kingside attacks. <laughs> because the next move... Is... So now White does something really cool that's constricting. He brings the bishop right back here to g6. <laughs> and you're going, wow. Again, you can see that he's attempting to crack the king side open. Black opts with this next move to take the knight instead of the bishop. My suspicion is, I, I mean, looking at the position, really, uh, were he to take that bishop and let the queen in here, then it's just one more move in his checkmate, right? So... It makes sense that black has to take the knight. That's basically the only option. This changes the dynamic of the board position because, yes, he loses the knight, which would have made the h square or h7 square more important, but now because there's been an exchange on the g file with the knight, it opens up a different piece, the rook. To come up into the file if white so chooses. So now white has a diagonal and a file and he still has the attack on the king side. So this is getting tough for black. He defends as best he can. There's no point in throwing away the knight for nothing. Yeah, so g8 is truly the only reasonable alternative square that he can put it to. And now, bishop takes g7 check. Kablam! Again, the, the sacrifice, the incredible power of the position with the two bishops, the queen and the rook on the open file. I mean, the, the conclusion is inevitable, yeah? So the king takes... The bishop, the only thing the king can do, and now, of course, the rook will come zipping up here using the rook in the open file, which is the whole point of opening the file onto the castled side of the king. Check. 
Then the king comes here, and of course the rook will come and take f7 for the mate. This kind of blitz chess, this kind of spectacular sacrifices and putting your pieces into such wild, dangerous positions is what chess miniatures is all about, without question. So, now, I, I think I've gone on long enough in this video, but I have, truly, seriously, dozens of more of these games I'm going to do in a series of videos on chess miniatures. You don't want to miss this. These are some of the most razzle-dazzle astonishing games you will ever see. So, thanks for watching my video. Be good, do well, have fun, make friends, don't stay up too late at night, leave the world a better place than when you found it, and I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.